Hello there, and a very warm welcome to episode 116 of the Building Sustainability Podcast. My name is Jeffrey Hart, and every fortnight, join me as I talk to designers, builders, makers, dreamers, and doers. Together, we can explore the wide world of sustainability in the built environment by talking to wonderful people who are doing excellent things. Uh, right, this is the second part of my conversation with Paloma Gormley of Material Cultures. I think probably listen to episode 115 first. It might make a bit more sense of this. Uh, but this one, is, it's definitely standalone. Uh, this episode features a lot about clay, a lot about timber, and a lot about land. The other episode is focused around bio-based materials that come from regenerative sources. But really, I'd say the two episodes go best together. So start with that one if you can. Quick reminder to share this episode if you can, if you enjoy it. And also, and also if you rate the podcast and want to support it, it is independently produced by me, then you can head on over to the Patreon page. That is patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. There you can sign up and support the podcast. And I would thank you oh so much if you did so. Here we go. Enjoy the episode. I wanted to ask you about clay because I know mm-hmm. that you are. Uh, how do I want to phrase that? Um, clay is a thing that you're you're working with and, and playing with. Maybe playing with is the right term. You, you'd probably use something a bit more professional. Uh, <laughs> um, what what have you what have you been doing there, and what have you been discovering? I think that's, it, I think that's a perfect word. Um, playing, yeah, we um, worked a lot with hempcrete, and um, it's it, it's a really wonderful material. But you kind of can't get away from the fact that the lime still has quite substantial amounts of carbon in it, or carbon um, produced in the process of, of manufacturing it. You know, it's kind of one step away from being cement. Um, so uh, if, when you're looking for substitutes, clay is the um, best and the me- most immediate option and is um, readily available in quite large quantities across, across the country. Um, so yeah, we've been getting more and more excited about it. We've, we've worked with clay in a number of forms, unfired clay in a number of forms um, on a few projects. So working with strots, which are the the blocks produced by H.G. Matthews, which are unfired clay um, clay blocks, adobe, and some straw in them. Um, we've been using those as internal partitions on a few buildings. So we have a um, construction site at the moment in North London um, that is a community farm that's going up. We're building three new buildings there together with Studio Gill. And um, yeah, it's a really lovely material to work with. And it's really nice turning up on the building site. The, the buildings are predominantly straw bale, and, um, and then they have these struck partitions. And it just makes such a difference, you know, going to. Well, it's quite a kind of conventional building site in many ways, and there's a cement mixer going, and it's full of clay and straw, you know, rather than cement, and um, that just feels so exciting. And there's kind of straw everywhere, all across the site, and kind of nothing, nothing on the site that is toxic or yeah, it's, it's, that's been a really exciting. Um, Project for, for us, for me particularly, because I, I think I've always generally kind of built things um, in quite a formal way with friends. Um, so projects like Flat House were, were done, were made like that. So to be working with a with a kind of conventional large contractor and to see these materials in that context is, is really really exciting. Um, so I went for a, a site visit there uh, a little while back, and it was really interesting to see 
as you say, like a full conventional crew. And mm. they're sort of wrestling a little bit with the material and getting their head around how to use it. And there's one guy, Greg, who was sort of knows how to do straw bale and he's sort of stopping people put pallets of straw down in the middle of, you know, where it's going to get rained on and, and sort of <laughs> managing all of that and having a little chat to the the site manager there whose name is escaping me and he was sort of you know one part uh stressed by it but also one part loving it and uh yeah that interesting duality there mm. yeah it's but they ha- it does seem like generally they've been embraced it and i think that's a real kind of excitement really in the change or and then in the idea of doing things doing things differently but yes definitely there's teething teething issues of things just being just a little bit different isn't it you know from the from what we're used to um yeah but it's kind of amazing they're they're quite techy as a contracting firm, they're called Work Limited, and um, they have people building on site off from a directly from a three D model. And they don't really work with two D drawings, so there's people walking around with iPads with this um, very complex digital model, and there's something really glorious, I think, about the combination between you know a straw bale kind of straw bale technology and then this kind of state of the art um, world of iPad contracting um, and those two things coming into collision, the collision is yeah kind of, again a bit of a fantasy in a way with, because it shows that they're they're not in conflict um, mm-hmm. you know, that, that we that some of the ideas that we have about kind of contemporary things are you know, not in any way undermined by the appearance of natural materials in that world. Um, but clay, <laughs> um, yeah, so we've been using it on a few materials and then you laid an incredibly beautiful floor for us in a, in a refurbishment project for an artist's house and studio. Um, and that, yeah, that felt like a really exciting moment, I think, for us um, in terms of really understanding the extent of the versatility of it as a material. Um, so, yeah, more recently, actually, kind of in combination with this Material Cultures Make um, program or uh, project that we have going, which uh, last year has been situated at H.G. Matthews Brick Factory in Buckinghamshire. Um, four years ago, we, we built the frame for a building with some students, designed and built the frame for a building with students from St. Martin's, and then erected it at H.G. Matthews in the corner of the Brick Factory, thinking we'd be back the next year, and then COVID hit. Um, so it's only in this last year that we've been back to finish it. and. Um, it's been, it was always kind of made as a learning tool, that building, it's a classroom that was designed and built in a classroom and has yeah, be- become a kind of living, continue to be a living classroom through um, kind of the experimental ways in which we're completing it. So it's, um, so it, Insulating it, there's a there's a lightweight timber frame, and then we're insulating it with um, various materials. So there's elements of hempcrete, but then we've also, I think, most excitingly, been looking at light earth. Do you want to give a quick e- explanation of what light earth is? Yes. Um, so we've been working with light earth, which is a essentially a way of um, making a very lightweight insulating material with a clay slip and then some kind of bio-based, um, uh, something called aggregate, I guess it is an equivalent of aggregate. Um, so you you coat um, 
you make a clay sip and you coat these uh, bits of plant matter. It could be wood chip, it could be um, straw, it could be hemp, um, very lightly, and then um, take that material and either cast it directly into a wall or you can make blocks. And it, it's the same principle as hempcrete in that um, it's lightweight, so it holds quite a lot of air, but the clay gives it a kind of material integrity and also um, in that it kind of holds it together. Um, but it also gives it a bit thermal mass. So it means that it can hold, that means that it can hold heat um, and, and be cooling um, also. So in this instance, we, we tested a lot of things actually. We looked at Hempshire with slip um, and then Roland made up these amazing huge tonne bags of um, straw and clay and then left them for about a week. And I think that was a kind of genius move. We were a little bit worried about the whole building being a bit soggy and taking a very long time to dry. So you, you've kind of pre-dried the mix so when it went in it was just kind of a bit sticky um but and still very like it's still very malleable and able to kind of re-adhere to itself but i'd say half the kind of drying had been done um so that's really exciting i think partly because it's once you have a material that can be um kind of wall mass that can be cast or formed or made into blocks, but essentially be directly plastered onto you. You're removing a whole layer of the um, building, but also because you don't need a sheet material, um, and therefore removing a, a process from the construction. So you're, you're simplifying um, what it means to build a building. And in our minds, the simpler the building, the better. Um, because they're easier to fix, they're easier to diagnose, um, quicker to build, less complexity in terms of how many trades. So the, the more you can do with any one material in a building, I think the better. Um, and that's what's amazing about these materials. You know, they're, they're extraordinarily versatile. Um, they can be your insulation, your wall mass, your thermal mass, your fire lining or um, all of those things. And I guess, yeah, the, the, the qualities that the clay brings um, to the, the plant matter are really important um, in that they add a, an element of fire resistance, they add an element of kind of uh, hydroscopicity so they can take excess moisture out of the air. Um, thermal mass, as I already spoke about, um, the ability to hold heat, um, and and yeah, creating a, a material that has its own integrity and, cre and can create warm mass. The I, the thing I really like about light earth is just the you can sort of use clay and clay slip and and whatever you've got to hand, you know if you have loads of wood shavings it's wood shavings if you've got loads of straw it's straw um mm -hmm. yeah whatever that matter is it's mm -hmm. what your local matter is is almost certainly going to work well potentially going to work let's not <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're doing a project in a woodland in norfolk and um, building a kind of tree house or at least a stilted house um, in a forest and trying with our, our brief, our own brief that we set ourselves within the project brief, um, is to try and use exclusively materials from the forest apart from the glass, which I can't find a way around. I was trying to find a local Glass manufacturing, but it just doesn't exist. I think there's one place in Scotland where we still get glass sand from. Um, but uh, yes, the UK is not making glass um, at a regional level hmm. from 
regime in Swiss sense, as far as I can tell. So yeah. far. Um, but yeah, so we we are working with the timber for the forest, but but trying to use that timber responsibly um, and make quite a kind of lightweight, relatively efficient building. Um, but then use yeah the 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 sawdust waste um, from the milling process as the insulation. So the intention at the moment anyway is to use clay from the site and um, as you say, the waste that will come from the cutting of the timber to to insulate the building. Um, which I think will be I don't know, so, yeah. Uh, well, it will be an interesting process, a useful process. But I think we also, we see each of our projects also as a way of telling a story um, about a possibility or what it would mean to kind of re rethink the way that we relate to um, yeah to our buildings or landscape. Um, so this one. This tree house project is going to be very much about um, the species that we species of timber that we're using, um, and how um, if we are going to move away, similarly to kind of agriculture and forestry, we need to move away ideally from these kind of industrialized monocultural plantations, um, which grow kind of a handful of species of trees which are then very susceptible to the um, disease. Um, then we need to look to a much greater um, spectrum of timber species and that's going to have a massive impact on the timber that's available for construction. And um, you know, There's only a relatively few species that are actually um, graded in, in this country. So that means grading a system that gives a structural rating to a piece of timber um, and it applies to a few select species and effectively anything outside of that is almost impossible to use in a, in a building um, because there are very few engineers who will be prepared to warranty or have that specialist knowledge and mm. be prepared to warranty. Um, the use of, kind of non-standard in inverted commas construction timber. There's another area of, that needs a lot of thinking, a lot of change, or there just will need to be a lot of adaptation as we plant more biodiverse forests and look at what species actually are going to be resilient to global heating and kind of many risks from pests and diseases. Um, then yeah, we're not going to have this kind of very reliable softwood um, stocks that we've become accustomed to. How does chestnut fit into that? Because I'm I'm on a real coppice push at the moment. I would love to see you know coppice timbers, whether that's chestnut, oak, uh, hazel, really sort of find a place in modern construction. Um, not least because of the um, the incredible regenerate the biodiversity that happens when you coppice a, a woodland is is incredible yeah absolutely completely agree um it's incredibly undervalued and um you know coppice timbers can be very substantial as well and often very straight it's really high quality timber um the only i think the reason that the industry cannot deal with it is that it's not regularized not directly mm -hmm. it's round um and that throws everything out you know um in terms of the kind of standardized processes that the construction industry is used to working within so um i'm totally with you and we've we've done a project two years ago with our students when we were looking at forestry systems and if quite a few of them, two or, two or three groups worked with roundwoods, coppice roundwoods, um, for exactly the reasons that you just described. Um, and we struggled to 
things to um, together kind of come up with solution, kind of contemporized solutions for that rounded. But I think we need to revisit it um, because there definitely is potential there, I think. Um, there's people like George Faraday doing work on this, on working with kind of um, rounded sections, doing really good work. Um, and Hook, Pup, um, also do quite a lot of work, but uh, the trajectory of their work is often towards the kind of digital bespoke um, rather than mm -hmm. sounded a, a kind of new standardization that can accommodate greater um, complexity, which is, a, I think, maybe more where we would want to push it. Um, yes, I think that is an open topic and a, um, there's a lot of possibility within it because, yeah, as you say, in terms of biodiversity, but also in terms of the, the crop cycle, you know, um, tree timber from um, from trees has a minimum kind of twenty year crop cycle, and that's an absolute minimum. Whereas coppice, you can create extraordinary amounts of biomass um, and really good timbers um, very quickly. Just interesting and yes. looking at some round wood behind your head. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes yeah i mean i'm obviously uh, a big fan <laughs> one of our students in zurich uh where we're running this bioregional um systems brief is actually developing a uh system for a house with round wood columns but set within hempcrete walls so you lose um the irregularity of the timber because you're offsetting your shuttering so you have a completely smooth wall on the inside and a smooth wall on the outside. And then some expression of the round wood is columns internally, but um, that actually feels like quite a compatible system. Um, because it's always the junctions where you, meet, where you need to meet a kind of interior wall or a flat plane um, surface yeah, becomes difficult. Definitely. But, Potentially, yeah, with a with a cast material like concrete or um, light earth. This, I think, there is. It, yeah, the students' project is really interesting. I think it, it feels like there's an opening there for um, for more development. It certainly takes out lots of headaches, doesn't it? Just put it in the middle. Obviously, I want to see the timber, <laughs> but you know, you can't have everything. <laughs> I understand. You're allowed a few columns. <laughs> My only um, a slight concern, and you've sort of mentioned it earlier, is that how does how does coppicing not get classed as a monoculture when you've got you know a forest full of chestnut or hazel? Is that not a sort of disease risk or a you know if ash dieback for chestnut appears? There's no sort of security in that. I think it comes down to how you design the landscapes, because these landscapes don't exist yet. I mean, there are there's some kind of historic coppice woodlands, but not very many, to be honest. Um, so Wakelands is always a real touch point for us. Um, there's a farm in Suffolk, uh, which is, a, is kind of part science laboratory, part farm. Um, and is an alley cropping system. So they have um, alleys for the production of grain or fruit and vegetables. Um, and then between them are these quite broad kind of verges, but that are planted with trees and shrubs. Um, and they have very mixed systems. So they have um, verges that have um kind of fruit trees in them or walnuts or cherries or um and then some kind of timber crop species then they also have large amounts of coppers um and they're planted in a way with well, 
the alleys make them accessible for harvest because once you've harvested your crop then you have an accessible route through um, but the the lanes effectively um, help buffer the spread of disease so that works very much for the um, for the grain crops you'll get a disease um, in one alley they've had seasons uh, in years where a whole alley has gone down with some kind of blight um, but it hasn't transferred across um, through that bridge um, brilliant so it's a really resilient and effective system and you know I'm not a horticulturist horticulturalist is my expertise, but um, there are people doing that thinking and doing that research and there are ways to grow um, uh, very efficiently and very densely, um, but in a way that is also highly biodiverse and it doesn't require a whole monoculture. It, uh, it seems to come back to that um, idea of construction and agriculture coming together and the the sort of necessity of that for for good um what do you think needs to happen for for those conversations or that collaboration to happen good question um i guess what we if you could just trying... solve this you know <laughs> <laughs> um yes it's it is a big one um I think what we're trying to do again is to kind of look at look at it at different scales. So we um, have another project that we're working on at the moment where we're um, going to we're working with food growers and people that work within a kind of agroecological framework um, to design and build a building together. Um, and for us, it's about developing this pedagogy that I kind of talked about in MC make. Um, so kind of way of thinking about how we learn from each other and how we teach each other. Um, but also just about us beginning to understand what it actually would mean to um, work or think kind of seasonally and be a bit more connected to um, people that grow things and the ideas around growing things and, and what plants need. Um, but I think there's another interest kind of buried in there, not even buried, but um, in in that mix, which which is that it feels like uh, um, kind of the conversation about social justice, land justice, um, and all those kind of political um, contexts of the, the stuff that we've been talking about is so much more advanced in the in the world of food growing. Um, so I think it's also to kind of learn from that um, and see what can be brought into brought from that world into architecture. So in a way, that's a kind of um, for us. I think just going to be a really instructive process. It's a, it's a small building. Um, the building itself isn't necessarily going to have a huge impact, but it's very much about process. Um, on the other end of the scale, um, I think there needs to be a land reform movement um, and land reform lobbying. Um, and that's something that, given a bit more time and capacity, and maybe that it will feel possible in the next year that I think we would love to be part of. Um, uh, so there was a lot of really good work that I think was done around the um, uh, time of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party um, in policy work um, and really interesting work done about land um, that I think should be built taken up and, and, and built on. Um, in a way, lands, these kind of land issues are uh, cross-party issues. You know, they, they could be taken on by any government. Um, 
Uh, and they're absolutely, ne- again, kind of absolutely necessary for the kind of future sustainability of um, the kind of human project. Um, so making those arguments and um, doing the work around how that that is communicated, um, I think is really important. Um, and architecture really, or building construction, making buildings is is a relatively small part of that, but it but it is part of that story, and, and I think it's been that hasn't been acknowledged. Um, for quite a long time, uh, other than like than land use and the need of need for land to build new housing, etc. But I think it's a much deeper and more complicated relationship as, as we've been discussing. Um, so yeah, there's I think there's a there's a coordinated conversation that. That needs to happen and that could i think happen um through a campaign we also need to change in education and how we think about these things and that's where i feel very hopeful actually that, that that's happening you know go into any architecture at school at least and all anyone wants to talk about and again it may be that i'm living in a, in a total bubble but um is is ecology and that's amazing and that's that's been a really significant change that i've witnessed in the time that i've been teaching over the last 10 years um it feels very profound and very real but yes spreading that change i'm not sure if i'm not sure if the same is true in construction schools or in other industries um and then there's a lot of um, regulation change that needs to happen and I guess will be addressed by the campaign work but um, yeah there's, I think there's, we need both top down and bottom up action and then the final thing I think is around um, final thing is around certification and testing of these materials and there's so many amazing products and ideas that just um, can't get through the kind of bureaucratic or financial hoops of um, the certification process. And it's incredibly limiting. So some national investment that's very targeted towards genuinely low carbon solutions um, and new materials, I think, is really important. Um, there's been a lot of money going to the circular economy in the last kind of five years, and unfortunately, I think a lot of that, in a way, is just serving to allow us to not change our practices because you can design a building with steel so long as you say that steel is going to be recovered at a future point, even mm. though that steel is potentially kind of virgin extraction and. Um, involves a huge amount of carbon in its production and you can never be sure of the secondary life of anything but also we just we just don't have the carbon budget to to afford to to carry on so yeah i think that unfortunately there's unfortunately there's been a lot that's been caught up in the circular economy narrative that is um unhelpful yes i was just having a conversation with uh with matthew from uh, the cork house um you're saying that um, it's so frustrating that the the assumption of a bio-based material is at the end of life it's going to be burnt and the mm-hmm. assumption of a steel is that it's going to be reused. Mm-hmm. It's, it doesn't quite seem fair, does it? No, it's really unjustified. The, each material is equally as able to be, to be reused in a building. Um, and we just need the, the processes in place to, to enable that to happen. Um, but it does give me comfort that bio-based materials um, can ultimately return to their bio-nutrient cycles um, and it's become part of that, that natural carbon cycle um, you know, through composting and through... Um, yeah, becoming plant matter again. 
when we're absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. So it's not a bad last resort, is it? It's exactly. That's the kind of ultimate underpinning of a yeah of a kind of end of life for a building is is a yeah I think which is just such a different paradigm from from the one. That All right. Thank you, Paloma. That was brilliant. I think both of us were quite tired. I think Paloma's uh, child had been been up all night and I'd had a rogue night of no sleep. So uh, (laughs) apologies if we were a bit bleary. I'm really pleased with all the things that Paloma said. And she really, um, she did inspire me in lots of ways. Uh, I hope that she has you too. Okay, there's some links in the show notes. Um, H.G. Matthews, the uh, the unfired clay brick people, uh, Studio Gill. Uh, there's a link to the Wolves Lane Community Centre, which was the one we talked about. Uh, the Flat House, got to mention, that's a great house to look at. Um, there's an earth floor that I did uh, for an artist studio uh, a few years back. Um, that's very, very beautiful. One of my favourite floors I've ever done, I'd say. Roland Keeble gets a a mention. Um, He is a friend of the podcast. If you like clay things, then do a search on our website for his bite-sized episodes he did. Um, But also there's a link to his Rammed Earth Consulting page. There's a link to Hook Park. Oh my goodness, I love that place. Yeah, such inspiring work. And also Wakeland's Farm, which just sounds like the best place. I absolutely want to go and have a look around there. Um, I wanted to chat just a little bit about light earth and it really is. I absolutely love it as a material. Um, I really love that you can make it from from pretty much whatever your little scraps are, um, your sort of bio-based matter and, and a good bit of clay. I know there are a few people that, well, there's a few a few things in there that make it a little bit difficult to scale and that is depending on how you, the mix um, if you put in more clay, then you get a, a less insulative material. Uh, it's sort of rammed down into into shuttering. And if you ram it too hard, then you compress it all. There's less air, so it becomes not as insulative. So, as a thing that you're you know, if you're building something to a to a, a building code, then it's much harder to to get it consistent uh, and tested. In fact, I think for projects like the tree house that Paloma talked about. I think that's a really great, great space for it. Yeah, as I say, I, would, I love it. I really love what you can do with it and making insulative, insulative walls in this way is is fantastic. Um, yeah, I'd like to see ways of, of making it more scalable. Um, I don't know how that would be. Um, but maybe one of her incredible students will figure it all out in a project. It sounds like they're going to figure everything out. Very exciting. <laughs> um right links for this episode in the show notes uh, please do subscribe if you have enjoyed this episode uh if you want to check out similar episodes uh i'd probably recommend you go and check out summer islam and george masood uh they did two episodes uh, a couple of years back for us that's a good place to start there'll be a link to those in the show notes please do share this episode stick it on social media or write about it in a letter yeah or, or just Tell the people that you know would enjoy it. Um, Appreciate that. I'm not on social media at the moment. um, And so I can't do it. And it feels a little bit hypocritical to ask you to do it for me. Uh, Because really, you should just be ditching social media and feeling better about yourself. Uh, (laughs) I've read so many books. (laughs) Um, But yes, if you could do that, that would be greatly appreciated. Patron, if you'd like to support the podcast and you'd like to get bonus episodes and bonus material, there's about 10 minutes from this episode which have made it into the bonus stuff, uh, then head on over to patreon.com forward slash building sustainability. Uh, what else? Oh yeah, if you sign up to the patron, then you get 10% off all courses at the Netcom Craft School. I haven't mentioned the Outcome Craft School in at least an episode. You you must have been wondering what's wrong. Uh, Yeah, so patrons get a a discount on the the courses. Another little reason that you might consider becoming a patron. Okay, that is it from me. I wish you the very best of times. Spring is almost here. 
and it's in bulk in a week. I cannot, cannot wait. All right, sending you all the love. Until next time, bye-bye.